Okay, Baltimore City Council Ways and Means Committee. We're back in session, Council Bill 23-0381, Ordinance of Estimates for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2024. I'm Mayor Costello, Councilman from the 11th District Chair of the Committee. I'm joined to my far right by Councilwoman Danny McCray, second district member of the committee. To my immediate right is Marguerite Curran, staff to the committee. Uh, we also have staff members from Mayor Brandon Scott's office as well as Council President Nick Mosby's office. Uh, today we're here to start off with Baltimore Development Corporation. Colin, if you could introduce your team and then take it away. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Colin Tarbert. I'm the President and CEO of the Baltimore Development Corporation. I'm joined uh, by three staff members today. Our CFO, uh, Jeff Pillis, our, co our controller, Chevelle Dixon, and Kim Clark, our Executive Vice President. Would you like me to begin? Take it, yep, take it away. I said there was a slight delay, but. I don't know if someone can click for me. This clicker does not. Oh, this. I hit this this forward button. No, you. I, All good. I'll just go ahead for the sake of time and uh, begin, and then as the slides can catch up. So um, on the second slide, uh, agency mission, the Baltimore Development Corporation is the economic development agency for the city of Baltimore. Our mission is to grow the city's economy in an inclusive manner by retaining, expanding, and attracting businesses and promoting investment, thereby increasing career opportunities for city residents. Um, so our mission really is to grow the city's economy and uh, we're doing so in an intentional and inclusive way. Some of our goals for uh, fiscal 2024, um, not an exhaustive list, but a couple of the notable goals that we have is our continuation of the implementation of the Baltimore Together Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Uh, that was approved and adopted by the city in 2021. Uh, we began work on that pre-pandemic in 2019, so we're now finishing, uh, at the end of this year will be year two. And um, our goal is to host an annual summit uh, on Baltimore together to report out on the activities and the progress that we're making. Um, that is going to be scheduled for October 30th and tentatively held at the Everyman Theater. So uh, please mark your calendars. I'm looking forward to that event. Second goal is to complete the distribution of $11.7 million of ARPA funds via the BASE Network, which stands for Business Assistance and Support for Equity. This is our small business initiative which combines uh, grants along with technical assistance for um, small uh, businesses throughout the city. Complete the ETC strategic plan, hire an executive director and relaunch ETC. ETC stands for our Emerging Technology Center. That's our incubator technology program for entrepreneurs and we'll touch on that later. And then last, we'll make progress on projects, uh, major projects like Harbor Place, Pimlico, The Compass uh, and others and just wanted to note some of the major projects that we've completed in fiscal 2023 included Lexington Market, Topgolf, and the CFG Bank Arena. There we go. So I'll be covering three services under the Baltimore Development Corporation today. Uh, service 809, which is the retention, expansion, and attraction of businesses. Service 810, which focuses on real estate development. Service 813, which is entrepreneurial development. I'll begin with the retention, expansion, and attraction of businesses, Service 809. Uh, this service is to focus on increasing jobs in key Baltimore growth sectors, expanding companies located in Baltimore, investing in Baltimore, and providing financial benefit to Baltimore residents and the state of Maryland, as well as fostering opportunities for MBE, WBE participation. So the two performance metrics that you have before you, uh, the first is the number of jobs created or retained in Baltimore City, 
Uh, this one is obviously very important to us and one that we track carefully. Um, our target for FY24 remains the same at about 2,000 businesses. And if you look at our actual uh, through from FY19 through 2022, uh, you'll see that it hovers from somewhere between 17 and 2,400 or 2,300 jobs. So our target remains the same and has generally been consistent uh, in the last couple of fiscal years. The second performance measure is uh, companies that BDC assisted in staying, and I'll add and, and or growing in Baltimore City. And here our target is 150 uh, businesses that we aim to, uh, ex to assist. And uh, again, you can see our actuals year over year, which is uh, generally consistent with that 150 target, with the exception of FY21, which is much lower, but that was during the pandemic. So we kind of shifted um, our, our resources to, to do more response directly to businesses that were uh, affected by the pandemic, as opposed to necessarily you know, growing uh, in the city during that time period. The next service is 810. This focuses on real estate development. This service promotes real estate development, including strategic planning, development assistance, expediting building permits and other approvals, negotiating the sale or lease of city-owned properties, and managing urban renewal areas and business parks. Uh, and BDC remains the kind of point of contact for uh, investors and or businesses uh, interested in major real estate development projects focused on commercial development. Uh, the two performance measures we have for this service is the dollar value of private investment per dollar of public investment. Our target for FY24 is eight dollars of uh, public or private investment for every dollar of public investment. Uh, and you can see there those numbers are actually fairly um, they vary over each year. Um, and just to kind of give you a general sense, I think we look for the one to 10 ratio in terms of investment. You'll see some very large numbers in FY19 and 21. Those are driven majorly, mainly by larger projects like Port Covington and Harbor Point, but the bulk of the work that we're doing is really investing in neighborhoods and small businesses, and so the leverage um, is, is more around that one to 10 with a target of, of, of one to eight in FY24, just given um, the economic uncertainty. The second measure is the number of commercial uh, facades um, completed in our commercial districts. And there we have a target of 50, uh, which is generally consistent. It ranges between you know, 30 and 50 on an annual basis. And then our last service number is 813. This is entrepreneurial development. This service includes two programs. Uh, one is made in Baltimore. And the second is Emerging Technology Center, which is ETC. This service provides support to entrepreneurs and small businesses, including technical assistance and resources to uh, Baltimore entrepreneurs launching successful businesses focused on sort of two general growth sectors, one being technology and the other being manufacturing. And we have two uh, performance metrics for this service, which is the first of which is uh, number of jobs created by all current companies. And so our target is uh, 300. And you'll see that's fairly consistent between two and 300 year over year. And then um, our second measure is the percentage of total graduates still in business. And our target is 80%, um, which, is, which is fairly high given you know, success of businesses. But you can see there we've been successful in having between 70 and 100% um, over the year. So that gets to uh, the 80% target for keeping these businesses uh, operational. And with that, that concludes the overview of the three services, and I'd be happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Council President Nick Mosby, Councilman Chris Burnett, uh, 8th District member of the committee, Councilman Ryan Dorsey, 3rd District member of the committee, Councilman Mark Conway, 4th District, uh, as well as Deputy Mayor uh, Justin Williams. I see Executive Vice President Clark strategically stationed at a seat without a microphone. Um, Colin, I want to thank uh, you and the team at BDC for the excellent um, service that you all continue to provide on a daily basis uh, throughout the city to support our small businesses. Um, one of the things um, that I've mentioned to the council president in the past 
Uh, the facade improvement grant is something that is wildly popular and I think that um, the City Council needs to find a way to uh, help support an increase in that uh, just because of the demand. I know that you hear from council members across the city. Uh, there's a strong desire uh, for those grants. I know they run out pretty quickly. Uh, you guys do a great job of administering them. I don't have any questions, uh, but again, just want to thank you and your team for the great job you guys do every day. Mr. President, and we've also been joined by Councilwoman Odette Ramos from the 14th District. Uh, Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning. Um, I was excited to learn recently about uh, efforts in Pigtown and Greektown to do, I forget exactly what it's called, like neighborhood asset assessments. Uh, the BDC has led. I don't think the reports are out yet, but it's a pretty exciting endeavor. Um, do, uh, if you want to talk about it, feel free to talk about it. I think it's great. Um, maybe you did. I came in a few minutes late. Um, but uh, I'm, I think that this is a really valuable way of assessing what commercial corridors and uh, neighborhood Main Street kind of communities have to offer and what they're lacking. And um, I, of course, want to see this done in my district. And uh, uh, I'm already kind of endeavoring to do it on my own, um, but I'm, I don't know all the ins and outs of you know, what makes it good. I, I want to know if BDC has a capacity to uh, undertake more of this um, or what it would take to give BDC the capacity to undertake this at a grander scale. I, mean, I know that the Greek town and pig town areas are fairly limited in size and scope, uh, to do something like this for a whole commercial corridor like the three miles of Harford Road from like Caring Run Park up to Baltimore County is a much different kind of scale. Yeah, thank you, Councilman, for the question. We have a great team um, at, at BDC and we have some great resources in terms of the GIS mapping and other uh, business databases. So uh, if, if we haven't already, we can fairly quickly create like a base map um, of what exists in terms of commercial corridors. Um, I think the work that we're doing is a little bit more granular in terms of actually then doing what we might call like a windshield survey where we actually go out and walk the commercial corridor with, with partners and, and make sure that the data that we have from various sources is accurate. That's what takes a little bit more time. And then on top of that, then we're sort of partnering with the, the communities to figure out, okay, what are the strategies primarily around commercial vacancies the, um, the facade improvement program is, is one of our key programs that we have for leveraging investment. And then we've also been partnering with the State Department of Housing and Community Development in their Restore program, as well as um, Project um, the Bernie program to, to do fit out. So like oftentimes while we do the exterior of the buildings for businesses, the interior and the tenant improvements is a significant amount of money. Uh, and so we've been able to leverage the state programs to, to fill that. So uh, we can certainly get started if you have specific, you know, if you want us to look at Harford Road and create like a base map, and then we'd have to kind of plan from there on out like what we can handle with, you know. That's my question, state. is yeah. what will it take to be able to do that level of granular analysis that's beyond the windshield kind of analysis, the base map analysis? Like what would it take to be able to do that granular level at a significantly larger scale than what you have now. We, we could get back to you on that. I mean, it's basically, it's staff time, and it's also, the other key for us is having that community partner. Um, so whether it's a Main Street or somebody else that's kind of helping us uh, with, with the implementation of the strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we could get back to you in terms of what it might take to take, you know, I have to get back in terms of what we're currently doing, and then when that work concludes, and then when we could, uh, take on uh, additional commercial corridors or potentially add resources, but I can tell you that the one of our challenges is the hiring piece of it. So even if we have uh, we have like one or two positions open, although we've got the East team fully staffed at this point, um, it's still hard to recruit. So even if we have the resources, it's actually finding that person that can you know take on the project. But we can get back to you in terms of what we think the time is to do like the in-depth analysis for each commercial corridor, and then when we could start on you know particular corridor or other corridors. Yeah, I I think for. Uh 
information request, I'd really like to have some sense of uh, if you could give me a cost per length of roadway kind of assessment, something like that. It, 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 I mean, for, for the analysis piece, it's more just a time of having staff be able to pull the data, create the base map, do the windshield survey, and then come back and work with the community on specific you know, areas of interest. So it, it's, it's less of a cost issue, it's more of a time issue, a staff resource issue. And then in terms of implementation, I mean, that's where we would get into, okay, what are the priorities, how many? Yeah, I'm not worried about the Yeah, that, that would be more of a capital type thing. So we could get back to you on what we think that the time would be and when we would have you know, the availability, I guess, to go out and take on additional commercial corridors. Great, yeah, I'd like to get a sense of the cost of that time. Okay. Um, the other thing, uh, and I appreciate the chair coming to me first. I do have to leave here in just a few minutes for a couple of things. Um, is capacity for kind of policy analysis, uh, it's often hard as a city council member to get a, an agency to do a deep dive of policy analysis um, unless I put in a bill and then that triggers like a whole storm of like, you know, responses and things like that. Um, I'd like to know more on the front end before I go there. Plenty of agencies I think would appreciate and you know, don't put in this bill uh, without having talked to us. Um, I have a few different things that I feel like BDC could help with. Um, uh, you know, the city has varying density in different neighborhoods, different communities, and along different commercial corridors. We have different kind of circumstance. I, you know, I'd love to know how deeply BDC could endeavor into like uh, what potential that we have if we increase density in targeted areas or, you know, blanket kind of overall in the city, what kind of uh, financial gains we can have, what kind of community development gains can come as a direct or, you know, as a secondary kind of result of just allowing for density to be allowed, you know, to exist where it doesn't. Um, other policy things that have more to, also to do with direct impacts on real estate. Um, one conversation I've been involved in is about, um, you know, the building code and how many stories of interior staircases uh, can be allowed with a single staircase in a building as opposed to multiple staircases being required and things like this. Uh, I've certainly traveled to plenty of other places where, you know, fifth floor walk up is like a pretty common phrase in any city that was built before 1900 and yet we have very few fifth floor walk ups in Baltimore and they're perfectly safe, safe el elsewhere and it's prohibited by uh, the building code, you know, under modern standards. So, you know, the impacts for potential for real estate development gains by changing things like that to allow for things that we pr prohibit. And then other things simil similar, like um, what would it, you know, how, how might it benefit developers and therefore community development to modify things like our stormwater uh, uh, requirements, not just for um, quantitative, but qualitative, because these qualitative things tend to eat up land space on a site that is otherwise developable, but has to be, given over to this, and if there's ways that we can offset the specific location of that stormwater, how could that benefit real estate development, and again, overall community development and tax yield for the city? Um, you know, I'd love to be able to ask BDC for analysis and support on these things without having to put in a bill. Is this something that I can come to BDC for, uh, and, and who, how, how, you know, can we do this? Yeah, you, you could certainly come to me with the request of, you know, if there's a piece of uh, analysis that you think BDC can do, uh, we would be able to quick, quickly tell you if we can do it or whether or not we think there's a better resource for it. Um, some of the topics that you're talking about, I mean, obviously we're very interested in density and development and maximizing the tax base. We've done a, some studies on population growth and what the economic impact of that would be, like, you know, what's the economic impact of adding a resident? Um, and we partnered with Live Baltimore in particular on that study. Um, some of the other pieces that you're talking about, we would probably want to form like a working group. Um, and maybe that's something that you, instead of a bill, you could ask for like a working group to come together, if it's stormwater or building code. We, we could certainly weigh in on what we would like to see, but I would imagine that the other agencies would also want to weigh in on that. We could do it 
you know, whether it's an official task force or just a working group to try to get some direction on what the issues are, what recommendations could be, but certainly happy to, you know, work with you on answering any policy questions that we can delve into. Great. And the last thing uh, is uh, back to my first thing for a second. If there is, could BDC put together any sort of sort of like one pager on like what exactly gets looked at in that granular analysis of the community assessment survey? I would love for us to be able to share widely what exactly it is we're looking for to understand at a deep level what the street and the frontage of buildings and things like that, uh, what we're looking for. So, because I would like to be able to do that granular analysis, like I'd be happy to be the community partner for the area that I represent, you know, along with Main Streets, and I'm happy to allocate my staff time to doing that kind of on the ground foot walking granular analysis, but I, we don't know what to look for to make sure that we're doing it at the level that BDC would want for itself. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. We could do something of like a, like a toolkit for commercial corridor, you know, evaluation and then we could have, you know, once we complete one of our evaluations to show that as like the example. Yeah. Um, and maybe that could help other communities sort of take on some of this work and then we could provide, you know, guidance where we can or even some of the base information that, that's fairly accessible for us. When do you fin expect for the first of those? In, in I, I'd have to go back and check. I don't know, um, to be honest with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hello. I had a quick question about um, the public market strategy. What is the public market strategy from BDC and how we can leverage all of our public markets in the city um, to address the food insecurity options that we're seeing all across the city? And Colin, just for background, I asked Councilwoman Porter to bring this up to you, not in your capacity as president of BDC, but in one of the many other hats you wear as chair of the Public Markets Corp. Sure, I, I don't wear that hat anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I actually stepped down as Public Markets Chair in March, although obviously that was recently, so I think I can maybe give you some direction, although not necessarily answer completely. Um, so I, I was involved with the public markets for, for a number of years in my mayor's office capacity and then kind of continued that over at BDC. Um, so I, th I think you should meet with, with, with Paul Rupert, who's the current president and CEO of the public markets. BDC has provided funding through the city's capital budget as kind of a pass through to the markets. Um, and in my time at the markets and now with Paul at the helm, we've invested and this dates back to the Rawlings Blake administration, uh, about 65 to $70 million. A large chunk of that is Lexington Market, which was roughly 45, but Northeast Market, Broadway Market, Hollands Market, uh, and Avenue Market are all receiving funds or have received funds. Um, Hollands and Avenue continue, they're kind of in the process, as you, as you know, is being renovated at, at Hollands, and then the next will be Avenue Market. So I, I think there's, there's sort of, individual strategies, I think, for each market because they're so unique and each neighborhood's so unique. Um, but they're, they're, they're huge assets. They were in disrepair for many years. We've capitalized them. And now I think the focus is more on the operational side and how to like really engage community and using them public markets and bringing in vendors and filling vacant stalls. I can't talk to those specific strategies because Paul and his team are really on the ground implementing that, but, mm -hmm. but that kind of gives you a, a sense of the history and, and how we've invested in those and I mean. Yeah, and so that was, what, that was one of the reasons why I asked specifically you the question, one, where we are in that process. So I'm glad to know that it's moving along with Holland's Market. I've been um, kind of watching it from afar from my district, but I wanted to know what is the strategy of like getting those vendors filled, how we can leverage kind of food vendors, other vendors that are in that South Baltimore community, um, micro businesses that can use those stalls in order to kind of spur economic activity. I mean, in South Baltimore, we've talked about this, um, 
you know, we don't have many of the commercial corridors that we do see in the downtown um, area. Now that we have Port Covington, I think that that may kind of spur economic activity down there. But I want to make sure that we have some sort of way for those micro businesses to kind of engage in the marketplace as well. Yeah, I, I, th I mean, you should definitely meet with Paul on that mm -hmm. piece. I think, I mean, the, the markets for 200 and plus years have been like great incubators of businesses. Yeah. And so BDC still provides some of the technical assistance to those. We, we partnered with a lot of people in Lexington Market to get new businesses and make sure they had the capital to get started. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's there's some other partners involved in, in helping with, with Hollands as well in terms of some grants and other things to help get the fresh food yes. in, in particular, which is always a challenge because they're just difficult businesses to operate profitably. Mm -hmm. um, but I know a lot of the improvements that are going on right now at Hollands will helpfully make it easier for businesses to, to start up. One of the challenges that we've had with the markets is the upfront capital cost. Yes. And so hopefully some of the dollars, and I, I can't speak to it because uh, Paul's closer to the design, is making sure that the, the tenant improvements that the business has to do are, are hopefully, you know, easier to accomplish than, you know, fitting out an entire stall. Um, mm -hmm. And so hopefully the work that's being done now, which is mostly interior work, we did a lot of the exterior work mm -hmm. and just building infrastructure with the first phase of it. Now they're going in and kind of finishing the stall work. Hopefully they can put a lot of the plumbing, electrical, mechanical, yeah. the things that cost a lot of money and then, you know, have the vendor kind of fit out more of the, you know, equipment and cosmetic aspect mm -hmm. of it to keep the rent, the rent low enough. Mm -hmm. um, that they can operate and, and make, you know, a profit. And we were successful in doing that at Lexington Market. That was like a big piece of it was to try to do as much of the build out up front as possible mm -hmm. and then build that back through rent, but also make the rent reasonable enough that a small business could afford it. Okay. And then my second question is funny that you mentioned um, incentives related to food markets. What is BDC, BDC doing to enhance incentives for grocery stores to come into the city of Baltimore? So we currently have the um, grocery store um, tax, which helps both retain and attract grocery stores to, I think it's high food priority areas now. Um, and so that's a 10 10-year abatement on uh, personal and real property taxes. And then we do have the opportunity in a case-by-case -case basis to try to work directly with a landlord uh, and a tenant to see if there's something that we might be able to, to do. Um, we, our funding was cut a few years ago, unfortunately, for our food policy, kind of, not food policy, but our food attraction person. Uh, so we rely a little bit more on the planning department on the policy side. Um, but we would treat, you know, the grocery stores like any other business assistance, but knowing that those are like really key to, to, to sustaining neighborhoods. Yeah, the only reason why I'm asking that is because we had a recent closure with our price right in, South Bolt in Southwest Baltimore, and currently we have no grocery store outside of the Market Fresh that's coming a few months from now. And I'm wondering if there needs to be more dedication to those types of incentive packages from BDC, leveraging state funds, private dollars, foundation dollars, so that most so that we can get grocery stores within our neighborhood. Currently you know, within South Baltimore, we have no grocery store. And so that's something that I think needs to be addressed pretty quickly um, so that we can kind of spur that economic activity. And I know the, the profits are, are razor thin. I, I do realize that. But, you know, I'm really going to start pressing BDC to kind of really think creatively how we can get those incentive dollars in because it's becoming, you know, really a situation where there's nothing in, in our communities. So... Yeah, it, it's a challenge in your district. It's a challenge in a number of districts. I think, honestly, the focus probably needs to be on retention um, initially because it's it's hard to attract a, a grocer because um, the, the margins are thin and the capital costs are high. But where we do have grocery stores, we want to try to keep them. We were very, you know, we're still very much involved in the price right situation. It, it always takes longer than we would want it to um, in terms of backfilling that space. Um, that particular property is a challenge, just the way it's oriented. It's very inward and, and other issues, but it's certainly something that we have paid attention to for a long time and want to continue to partner with you and the communities to make sure that we retain our grocery stores. And then maybe where, where new development is happening, we're able to attract those, but that's even much more difficult. But we can't lose the ones that we have for sure. Yeah, and I think that it's so important because right now they're, they're in need of uh, 
two to three million dollars up, upfront investment. Like I'm, I was hoping that there would be some sort of incentive package that would help with that, that BDC can kind of grow um, leveraging state funds. But it seems to be um, my office and the consultant kind of working to gather those funds. And I think that that needs to be um, impressed upon BDC and the staff to kind of generate those funds, not my office and the consultant. So thank you. Thank you. We've also been joined by Councilman Stokes. We're going to go to Councilwoman Ramos, then Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, apologies for my being a little late. Um, I had a question about the FIG grant. Um, you may have mentioned it earlier, and I apologize. Um, it was recently changed from a grant to reimbursable. Um, well, I just have to say that none of my businesses on Greenmount Avenue can use it because they don't have the upfront costs. So how can we make sure that um, our businesses that really need the FIG grant can actually use it, um, even though it's, can we do a sort of upfront little bit? And then how, how do we make that work? So it's, it's always been reimbursable. We actually changed it in the last couple months to do exactly what you're saying um, within certain geographical areas, which Green Mountain Avenue would be in one of those areas. We're following the Neighborhood Impact Investment Fund areas. Mm -hmm. So we are providing, I believe, and can- Depends on what part of Green Mountain Avenue. What's that? It depends on what part of Green Mountain Avenue. My part of Green Mountain Avenue isn't in a in impact investment area. Okay, well, we can look at the specifics. We did change it for areas uh, in need of investment, like within the NIF footprint to be, um, a portion of it up front based on um, costs and then the rest reimbursable, I believe. Kim can correct me, if, but I think that's what we do because we saw that challenge with small businesses not having the upfront capital cost. Mm -hmm. um, so we can we can delve into it and look at the specific areas, but but we did change it to to do what you're recommending. Yeah, my part of Green Mountain Avenue is NIF adjacent. It's not in okay. We, so we can work with you. I appreciate I that, because that would be great. Um, OK, thank you. We'll follow up um, with you on that. I appreciate it. Um, and then my second question is, um, I'm interested in uh, service 80, well, let me just see, 809 um, on page eight, eight, 282 in the book, um, net number of new and expanding businesses in commercial corridors. What commercial corridors are you actually looking at there? All of our, like Main Street areas, just downtown, what are we looking at here? Those are uh, the RBDL districts, um, which some of them overlap with Main, just Main Street, some of them don't, but. Oh, those are RBDLs? Okay. I think we had this conversation about RBDLs at the beginning of the term. Um, so, okay, so that, that's what that is. Because I was just curious what, how you were measuring that. Because I actually have a lot of businesses that want to come into Green Man Avenue were hindered by a few obstacles, which we've talked about before. Um, and so this number could be so much higher <laughs> if it was, you know, including all of our, you know, commercial corridors and main streets. Um, and I think that that would be something to, to consider, considering that, you know, people do want to open businesses here and they want to open businesses all over the city. Um, so I would ask that you consider that. Um, um, consider that as well. Yeah, I, th I think we're just measuring it because we can get that specific data is probably mm -hmm. why we're using mm -hmm. the RBD. Yeah, contract. I think we had a conversation early in the term about including all of these commercial areas in our, uh, expanding RBDLs to all the commercial areas. Um, we just haven't been able to pursue it after that. So, um, Mr. Chair, I have one more question, but I can wait until the next round. Yep. Uh, Councilman Stokes and then Conway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, Colin, and your hard-working group over there. Um, I want to mention that the boost program that y'all use downtown, are you part of it? Okay. Are you going to do some incentive in terms, I think I mentioned this before, about some of the business that are on 25th Street right off uh, between Maryland Avenue. There's a lot of black-owned business there. And I had mentioned this to Mr. Al Hutchinson during the CIAA. We do this extra outreach for the businesses, but then when the CIAA is gone, it's no outreach in terms of finding out what kind of technical assistance that some of these um, businesses have. Have y'all, I, I think I mentioned it before, I would like for somebody from your office 
you go up there and just talk to them, talk about what kind of assistance you have for them, because it always happened during the CIAA, and then after CIAA, everything just, everybody go back and go back into their comfort zone. My second question is, um, were you part of the, I'm smiling because the 12th district getting ready to get a full service market on Orleans and Central Avenue. And I know how long since I've been on the council, I've been trying to get a market there. And I, I can smile and say that, but my question is, were you a part of this um, Perkins Somerset bringing that market to the 12th district? And the reason why I ask is because EDBI keep talking about they need density. And I just don't believe they need density because if you look at Somerset Perkins Old Town, there's not a whole lot of people there. So how is it one organization say we need density to get a market? We got a market coming with less people. So sometimes when, when you do market studies, they always say, oh, you got to get some more people. It's not the right income. But when you got foot traffic and driving traffic, and I know for a fact, people in East Baltimore in the 12th district want to eat. They want a full service market. So I never believe market studies because this is a good example of what a market study said, but guess what? We now have a full service market coming to East Baltimore. So my question is, how do you, how do you use a market study to determine whether a community that never had a market in 20 years still can't get a market? I don't understand what, what kind of questions do you use in terms of using a market study to say, well, they, can't have a market. They homeowners, they renters, they senior buildings, it's development. I know for a fact, talking to people in the community, they want a market and they are happy right now, but I don't understand how the market study can say no and we can really get one now. I'll take the, I'm sure there's a question there, but I'll, I'll, let me take the first um, one. We do outreach year round, so we're happy to go up to 25th Street and uh, meet with the businesses and tell them what resources we have available and what other resources might be available to them as well. Um, so happy to do that. On the grocery store question, I mean, it's <laughs> retailers are, are difficult to nail down. Sometimes they pick sites and we scratch our heads. Other times we're saying, this is the best site for you. And they say, oh no, that, that's not gonna work for us. So it's a little bit confusing. We, BDC, you know, well before my time, have been involved in attracting a grocery store to the Old Town area for decade plus now. Mm -hmm. uh, we were involved with uh, the developer and the retailer who I, I don't think they've been uh, named yet to, to um, hopefully open up a full service grocery store there. I would agree with you. I think it, it, a lot of it's location access. So I think having Orleans as a major thoroughfare and being sandwiched between Hopkins and downtown, um, it's a location issue. I think they also looked at um, the catchment area, uh, we had found uh, years ago um, that folks don't shop at their closest grocery store. Everyone thinks that they shop at their neighborhood grocery store, but we've, we've found that people really travel to like where they want to shop. <laughs> um, and so I think um, having variety in, in East Baltimore, they'll also be able to capture uh, a lot of the downtown Mount Vernon district, which you know, people might not think of as being close to Perkins Old Town, but it really is. I mean, it's just over the bridge. Um, and so I think those elements uh, helped attract that um, grocer. And then the, the piece of it is there might not be a lot of people living now, now but I think there's about like 2,000 units coming in as part of that whole project over the next, whatever it is, six to 10 year time frame period. So uh, it's great. It's been a long time coming and we're, we're excited for you in the district to, to have the full service grocery store. My last question is the Oliver community, um, I don't know if you remember when Stop, Shop, and Save was on Harford near Bonaparte, with the owners, Mr. Usain, he is now developing that building. I'd like to sit down and talk, have y'all talk with him about bringing a, a, mar a full service market to that, because he's willing to do that. And if you ride past that, you can see him put a new roof on it. I mean, he have all that access to parking. So I would like to reach out to your office with Mr. Usain and see how we can actually bring a full service market today also. Yeah, we'd be happy to talk with him and make sure he's aware of the programs that we have you know, available. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, um, 
and Colin and, and your team for the work you, you guys do. Uh, I, I really appreciate you. A um, couple of questions. I, I just sort of noted, no, noticed in flipping through the, uh, the budget that um, BDC and Live Baltimore both have had stagnant budgets. And noting how important your work is to economic development in the city and executing that vision for the city. I was curious um, why that is and if uh, additional capacity would allow us to accomplish more. And I, I don't know if that is something that affects your ability to get, get more done. You said static, right? Uh, it's been static for, yeah. for all the services that you mentioned. Uh, it's static, consistent budget. I see Laura coming up. I just, I just want to make one clarifying comment on that. For sure. both BDC and Live Baltimore, we do make an inflationary adjustment to their okay. budget every year. So it's not a flat funding level. We use the inflationary increases that we use across the budget mm -hmm. for our current level of service calculations. So for the um, n knowing that inflation has been a pressure for these organizations, um, you know, just like many organizations, the increase this year was about 4% um, for, uh, for each of the services in BDC. Um, also just want to note that, um, you know, these entities have the opportunity to participate in the enhancement process um, that's part of the budget process. They also have the opportunity to tap into other resources like the Innovation Fund and stuff like that. Traditionally, Live Baltimore BDC, when they've participated in, the, in that process, have seen levels of success. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, and um, I think that is important. I, I also want to keep in mind, just we know we have a number, a number of issues, grocery stores, getting more people to move into the city, keeping and bringing more businesses into the city. And a lot of that is sort of uh, between you guys and Live Baltimore and attracting and keeping people and businesses here, uh, noting that those are probably some of the biggest problems when we talk about our, our tax base and our ability to attract and keep residents here. Um, so, you know, I, I, maybe you don't have to have an answer for this now, but when we think about, um, you know, our, our big goal here, our big goal is to bring more people to Baltimore, noting that that allows us to bring in more tax revenue, which allows us to better handle city services and so on and so, so on forth. Um, so, yeah, uh, if there's something you want to add to that more than... No, I, I, th I think the reality of it is the issues that we're trying to address are, are not necessarily budget issues, um, okay. you know, a, additional funding. I, I think that, you know, we've been consistent and I mean, consistency is actually very helpful for us. Um, I think that um, we have been working to partner and trying to leverage funds from outside of the city. I mean, I think the city has got a ton of priorities. Sure, you know, everybody wants to be uh, the top priority, but I, I think it's time that we collectively at the city level, I think could go out and leverage significant dollars for, for these with state partners, foundation partners, and others, because I think the city can only do so much. And in some ways, you guys have a you know difficult task. It's kind of like you know robbing Peter to pay Paul, and certainly have been involved in this for, for a number of years to know that. So I think I would be more interested in sitting down and figuring out, okay, like what are our key priorities to drive population growth and investment? What are the policy decisions that we might be able to, to work on to change that don't necessarily cost us anything, but could, attract investment and we've done that you know in different capacities over the years and then also you know now i think with a, a great partner in the state or multiple partners in the state now i think we have the opportunity to really see the investment that baltimore hasn't seen over many decades um, and that that's probably the dollar amounts that we need in terms of like a state funding type of dollar amounts than anything that we can even do within bdc or even at the city level i appreciate that thank you um my second question is actually to piggyback on something my colleague brought up regarding grocery stores. You mentioned that uh, one of the big problems I have in my district is, of course, the same issue, grocery stores. Uh, when I came in office, we had zero. Um, we, we just lost one. Uh, and then um, another, uh, another grocer came in. They lasted for about a year. They left. The former grocer came back. Um, you mentioned that one of the most important things we could do would be to try to retrain, retain grocery stores. Um, what are some of the ways that um, we think about that out of BDC and how we sort of think about that more importantly in this budget? I mean, what, I mean candidly, like one of the issues that the grocery stores have, I mean, I think on that particular location, you know, it may have just been the model and the product that they were 
providing. Um, I won't turn to Kim because she shops there and lives in the neighborhood, but she could give you her personal comments off the, off the record uh, in terms of... Kim, Kim is my constituent, so she might start asking me questions. So we're familiar with that location. I, I mean, one of the struggles is just the, the cost of operation in terms of, you know, extra security cost and those types of things. And, and I'm not sure there's, there's much that we can do other than coordination, and we do try to make sure that... BPD is aware of, of, of our major tenants and grocery stores, and they've been great partners in terms of trying to address it, but they can only do so much. Uh, we have worked with the state to do some grants in terms of security at just shopping centers and that type of thing to help mm -hmm. address that. That that tends to be probably one of the, the more direct cost um, issues that we hear from grocers um, that we could, you know, maybe partner on in terms of trying to address. I appreciate that. And um, this would be, I guess, for an offline conversation, but um, I am trying to attract a, a second grocer uh, to, to the district and um, have had a number of conversations and have stumbled in those conversations. I'd love your assistance in trying to figure out how we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Vice President Middleton. Anyone in the first round who hasn't asked a question yet? Councilman Burnett. Um, uh, thank you, Director, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I wanted to go back to the uh, facade improvement programs. Um, so we've had one in my district that uh, was sort of marred in COVID and, um, you know, a lot of challenges along the way when, once we got the funding going. So I do understand that the, the complexities are probably um, more challenging than most given the context. Um, but I guess typically, what are the, is it normal for these programs to, to take a significant amount of time? Um, and what can we do? Because I agree with Councilman Dorsey that this is a, a critical program and helpful program. And when you look across the city, it's, it's, it, it makes a difference when people um, see improvements along our commercial districts, our commercial corridors, and that sort of perception of the area as they're, you know, driving along an arterial road, perhaps they want to turn in and see a little bit more about the neighborhood itself. Um, and so it's a critical program. What capacity challenges are you seeing with that initiative, and, and what are some ways that you think um, the council and the administration can be more supportive of expanding capacity for the facade improvement program? Because I do believe it makes a difference that in, in sort of the narrative and storytelling of our city um, and, and communities that uh, typically are not downtown and, and may not be as well known, but can be surprising, uh, surprising and have and real, real assets in their commercial districts. But, you know, the, the signage may not be up to par or, or been dated. And, uh, and so folks are a little bit more reluctant to engage in those communities without those, you know, new amenities or a new look and refresh. So what are some ways that you think we can, we can grow and build capacity of that program? Well, hopefully over the next fiscal year, you'll see, you know, uh, improvements. Like I mentioned, uh, we, we revamped the program to, to be more user friendly, especially in, in more disinvested neighborhoods or areas that need investment. So that, that change just happened uh, earlier this year. We implemented it. So hopefully we'll be able to get more um, businesses and, and clients who take advantage of the program because we've tried to remove the, the barrier of, of the upfront and reimbursable cost, at least like I think the first half of it. Um, so that's one. Two, we, we've just, we're just starting to come out of the effects of the pandemic like as an agency. Um, so one is staffing. Um, the, the West team who works on, you know, many of your, your projects uh, was a mighty team of, of two, now they're a mighty team of three, um, and hopefully four soon. So I think um, you'll, you'll see some additional capacity because we've been able to, to bring on uh, new folks. Um, and we're also now sort of, for the most part, done with our COVID relief programs that were, you know, just basically took up all the time for the last couple years. So, so hopefully those changes, you know, um, you'll see more um, progress and the, us being able to get more um, grants in your district as well as, you know, processing things faster. Oftentimes it also relies like on the applicant. Um, sure. And I agree with that. Some of them haven't taken on a, <laughs> yeah. a, a construction project and so they haven't hired an architect and do all those things. And so we, you know, we do our best to help them through it, but we can't do all of it. So um, 
So hopefully you, you see a positive change. If, if you don't, you know, feel free to reach out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this, this particular project was a mixed bag on, on all fronts, so I get it. Um, and having one or two people try to implement something like that is also pretty challenging, which is what I was asking about the capacity piece. Like, you know, what, is it more staff? And it sounds like that's happening. Um, the other thing that uh, comes to mind, and, and I, again, I understand it's probably a capacity piece, but for, it, for I'm sure implementing programs like this in an area that already has a main street or some other, like you mentioned, you know, community partners, uh, what we find in, in disadvantaged communities is that those structures may not exist. Um, and so it does put, put more pressure on your team to sort of do uh, all of the lead work and a lot of the outreach and, you know, ne negotiations and all of that, that having a Main Street or some sort of CDC or other formal entity could probably handle or take some of the load off. Has there been conversation about building capacity of, in, in areas that have, don't have those sort of entities in place? Um, whether those are like how to start a CDC or how to start a business association or business improvement uh, council or whatever we want to call it, like a lot of what I find is a lot of folks don't know where to start in the first place, and there's not it's not something that you can easily Google to you know just like all right we're gonna we're gonna try this. People sort of naturally float to community associations, which are, are obviously obviously a mixed bag, but when we're talking about engaging with businesses, it's even more complicated. Um, and so just thinking through, like, what are some ways that we can, because what ends up happening is that the resources continue to go in areas where the easy lift is there. They're the ones that are applying for the grants. They're the ones that are overseeing the grants. They're implementing it. They're doing the outreach. And so the communities are, that already have resources are the ones that continue to get more resources because they know how to seek them. And communities that don't just sort of languish because there's not capacity there. There's nobody there that really knows what they're doing in, that, in, this, in this way, it may not be their area of expertise. Um, and so what are some things that you think we can do differently um, to really build out those areas so that we're not continuing to build up already strong communities and leaving everybody else behind? Yeah, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying is the reality. I think you know, we try to do what we can to fill in where there are gaps. Um, I don't think BDC, like B, BDC haven't taken on capacity building. I don't think we necessarily could um, or necessarily are the best to do that, but I think um, maybe identifying specific communities that are in need and have, I mean, it's always trying to like, it, it really needs to be like a grassroots effort where you have someone that wants to step up or, or, or community that wants to step up and then connecting them with resources. But I would think if we identified a couple of those communities or community leaders, I think that we could find the resources to, to do that. Um, I've seen it done with other, um, communities, uh, thinking in particular of uh, the South Baltimore area, like you know, Goldsecker and others have come in and helped to do that capacity building. Southwest Partnership, for example, didn't exist, at least when I think I was you know, in the mayor's office, and then it, it, it gained traction. Anchors has supported it, others. So I think it's an opportunity. If you have specific areas, I, I'd be happy to kind of sit down and think of ways to connect them with the right sources to build capacity, because it makes our jobs a lot easier if we have someone either marketing our programs or being able to help explain our programs, because, you know, at least more recently, we have been limited on staff, so we do rely on the main street directors or others in the community to, to kind of help people through the process. And I, and I would say what I was thinking more is like what the planning department does with the planning academy, where they're you know bringing in a cohort of community leaders, helping them understand the zoning code, the planning process, and, and ultimately what it does is it just is a value added to that neighborhood because now if there's something in their community that they want to know how to navigate the BMZA or a planning commission, they better they, they have a better understanding of what's happening and how to better advocate for their community. And I would say something to model like that, and maybe it's not you guys that are leading it. Maybe there's some sort of partnership that comes to fruition between multiple agencies, or it's a part of the planning academy. I mean, I don't want to like sign you guys up to like work with the planning department, but like they, maybe they already maybe it makes sense to just add to the curriculum that they're already working on, or have someone from BDC come in and talk about main streets or facade improvements, or just sort of so that you know, because you, you have this like folks that are like signed up to give their time, multiple weeks, multiple months to be better advocates, and I think the more we can pour into them 
um, with that sort of knowledge base, uh, the stronger those communities will be. And I know we had a pretty good participation in the last round of the planning academy of folks in my district that were just like mean well community leaders who are just needed that additional like technical assistance. And now they better understand like when something's coming on my block and there's a sign in the lawn that says, you know, there's a hearing, they can better mobilize either for or against because they understand what they're supposed to be saying in the first place or who they're supposed to talk to or what the process is supposed to be versus things just sort of happening to you <laughs> or you just don't get the resources at all because you don't even know where to start. So just something that we can talk offline to figure it out but I think that there's an opportunity here to really build on that so that we don't continue inadvertently in some ways to continue to dump into communities not dump but like resource already resourced areas and folks that don't really know the process is you know just sort of get left up to, to the side thank you thank you mr. chair I was thinking the planning academy as you were talking the whole time I was thinking the planning academy was like the model so we could do like I think you're right I think partnering with them and doing like a subset on you know, community development, we could partner with HCD and probably some others and maybe even bring in some of those CDCs that have built capacity over the years and they can talk about how they did it. I think it's an excellent idea. Thank you. We have a hard stop in three minutes. Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was curious about something in service 810. Excuse me for not facing you. I'm trying to look in my book here. <clears throat> um, total number of taxes at phase in generated by BDC controlled development projects. Could you expand on what exactly that means? It's on page 284 of the book. Yeah, I think those are the, the formerly city owned properties that BDC took through the disposition and development process that are now on the tax rolls. So can you give me an example of what that is? Um, I mean, I'm just thinking of one off the top of my head, but like I, I would assume like the, the, the bathhouse redevelopment on Pigtown Main Street, for example, that was a former vacant city owned property, which BDC issued an RFP for, we went through an LDA process, and now it's you know mixed use apartment and commercial development. So I okay. think that I think now that that's on the tax rolls, we would we would look at how much real property tax is being generated from that, along with any piggyback taxes, which would be like income tax from new residents, that type of thing. Okay, gotcha. Um, the other question that I had was whether or not um, it's your shop or it's finance that works on trying to get data about economic impact of the um, of the TIFs. Um, in terms of jobs created, long-term <coughs> impact, do you have that data? Does that what? Who's got that data? In terms of looking at each of our TIF projects and seeing what the actual Im economic impact has been. I, I believe it's Treasury Management. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, it's within Treasury Management in Finance. So that'll be a question I'll ask you next. Sounds great. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Colin, Kim, team. Thank you all for the great work. Uh, appreciate you coming by. Uh, we are now in recess until 10 a.m. sharp for BBMR. <laughs>